The idea that some ancient civilizations had high technology and engineering, much as we do today, fascinated me. So I enlisted the help of British engineer Christopher Dunn. But before we met in Egypt, I visited him at the Danville Metal Stamping Plant. Okay, we moved beyond now what it takes to actually cut something. How, how were they checking it? You know, how were they guiding that tool? Uh, uh -huh. Because okay. obviously they had to have had some metrology instruments. They had to engage metrology instruments to be able to verify that they were maintaining parallelism between this surface and the opposing surface right there. Uh, and you just don't get that by line of sight or saying, you know, oh, that. That's good enough. We'll get Joe on the job today because he's got really good eyesight. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, see, I, I could go with some, some of that in small grooves and stuff like you're saying there. But that one. I mean, and so basically the conclusion on, on these artifacts and a lot of the other artifacts that we look at is, you know, they were using tools that no longer exist. They're no longer, they're not in the archaeological record anymore. They do not exist anywhere. And so then the question is, okay, what are the minimum requirements? What are the minimum, what's the minimum tooling level or uh, technology, if you will, to be able to do this? And, and that, this is the most striking example where people just go, whoa. Because well, how for, for, for you as an engineer and also a, uh, an expert machinist, Corners, inside corners, mean something to you, right? Certainly. Yeah. Five thirty seconds of an inch inside corner on those boxes, top to bottom. Now that photograph's a little blurred. Now th that's not two pieces coming together. No, no. It's cut that's out just of a, a solid, square granite square, fillet. Solid block. Consistent all the way down. And why would they really have to be so precise is what blows my mind. Now this is how they would, you know, conventionally they would say this is how they, they built something like that. And then for uh, squaring something off, of course, you know, the, the way a carpenter will square a frame, obviously measure from corner to corner, mm -hmm. which <clears throat> is a low tech compared to what we have here. And you can't, you can't verify that with a piece of string. I mean, you, you know, that kind of precision, you can't verify with a piece of string. So that, that's what we're faced with. And there's not just one there. It's not like they got lucky on one box. There's over 20 of them in this facility, down in the rock tunnels at the at Serapeum near the Saqqara in Egypt. So I'm back to they had, like you mentioned earlier, they had hundreds and hundreds of people spending hours and days and months and years doing this stuff. But let me, let me take you back to the, the historical information on the, on the Serapeum, okay? You know what they were supposed to be using for those boxes? They were burying the Apis bull, which was a revered animal, okay? The Apis bull's lifespan is supposed to be 28 years, and they say that when an Apis bull was selected, uh, they would start building his burial tomb. This is uh, Egyptologist. Is that what they say? Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, 28 years. Now, they've also done uh, some time studies on how fast they can remove granite using the ancient Egyptian tools. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, you use the material removal rate of the old methods and the multiply that out down, huh? by the time, you know, using the maximum number of workers that you can actually get in the work at the work site. And you're not talking 28 years, you're talking 50 plus years. Mm. And that's, it, that's just roughing the bloody thing out. That's not even lapping it finished. So now we're talking power tools, right? Exactly. Okay, right. Exactly. Yeah. From what I'm seeing there, 
tool. I'm looking at that picture, and there's tool marks on it. Mm -hmm. Anything mm -hmm. we machine, though, most of what we machine, there there are tool marks. You just don't see them because they're so minute. Mm -hmm. But also because of the the feet of the tool cre yeah. controls that surface finish. Mm -hmm. If you plow down through a piece of any kind of material, you're going to have a rougher surface. Mm -hmm. If you go slower, the feed rate's slower, the RPMs are faster, you're going to have a nicer, smoother finish. Mm -hmm. So this blows me out of the water a little bit because of those tool marks. That te That's telling me they wasted no time cutting through this thing. Okay, it's, yeah, really now, bad. I mean, I've like, been talking lapping and all this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a feed rate of 100,000 per revolution, which you bet it'd be difficult to achieve that in aluminum using carbide tools, okay. let alone in granite. Right. And, okay. You know, so basically what you're looking at is a something that is only explained if you consider non conventional types of machining. My first impression was, with very little historical background, that all this was done by hand. It was lapping and chiseling and, and took many hours, days, weeks, took a, lot, a large amount of time. But after looking at some of the, uh, gra or the uh, granite that I've seen, I question if it was even feasible to do by hand. And it kind of leads me into directions of thinking about the application of machine tools, for lack of a better, um, some time ago. I think all the evidence in Egypt indicates that there was a high civilization in prehistory. Now when we look at the tools and the technology available to the ancient Egypt, we have to consider that the culture that built the pyramid, that built all these other monuments, was far older because the tools do not exist for that particular epoch. So it doesn't matter what site you go to in Egypt, whether it's Abu Ghraib, Abu Rawash, whether you're going to the temples in Upper Egypt, uh, there was always some signature of technology and that signature is actually the machine tools that we used and the marks that they left in the stone. And those marks are not just the cutting marks but the geometry of the stone. I, I, don't, think, I don't think it's an exaggeration to assume that a culture that has the genius to devise these wonderful miracles of engineering, limited that expertise and genius with just the design of the product. They had to have had the tools to match the job. According to Chris's theory, the ancients not only had electricity, but they had power tools as well. Chris shares my interest in ancient technology, so I had him take me around Giza for a day to look at things from an engineer's perspective. One of the great mysteries of the past is the enigma of the colossal cities of the ancients. How were they able to quarry and move these giant granite blocks? Many of these stones are extremely hard and difficult to cut, such as basalt and granite. How did the Egyptians build these complex geometric wonders? Did they use brute force? or some kind of high technology. So what we found here on the Giza Plateau is 
one of these granite blocks that's been contoured. Chris is going to check it with his, uh, his precision tools to see if there's some indication of modern machining techniques here on the granite. What we have here is uh, a prime example of modern machining. Um, we have a contour, not a true radius, but it's a contour. And the contour is precise. If you look at the gauge, the surface gauge, you'll see that there's very little light that's showing between the interface and the granite. The, uh, the gauge is accurate to within one ten thousandth of an inch, which is one twentieth the thickness of a human hair. Wow. Yeah. It's very uniform then. It's very uniform. There's, there's some imperfections, but probably if I was to estimate how precise it was, I mean, I would say from, I'd say five thousandths of an inch, which is quite remarkable, really. Okay, really, yeah. Yeah, uh, over that entire contour. Now, the features of this stone, uh, you have this, you have this radius, this radius here, that that blends into. It's almost like it goes straight into the blend radius at the face. Okay. Okay. So, obviously, I mean, you know, you look at this, you can't, you, you can say you, there's no way you could turn it on a lathe to achieve a true radius. So they had to have had a means of replicating that contour with precision over the entire length of the block. Okay, and how would you do that? Well, today we would do it with a, uh, like a CNC machine or, or we could do it with a uh, in the old days, in machine shops, we'd do it with a profiler, where you'd actually follow a template with a uh, rotating tool or a vibrating tool. Okay. And 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 continue that, step it over, and continue that contour with precision right to the end. Now, this is where it becomes interesting because. You need to get a really good shot of this corner. Okay, so now what we have here is something very, what we, what we recognize in uh, modern manufacturing as a, an, actually it's an engineered or designed feature. If you want to marry or fit a object with a sharp corner with a face. Um, and also be able to use a tool to create this that has greater rigidity and stability. So you'd use a larger tool, and this is done with a ball, like a ball radius a tool, a ball mill, ball end mill. So this radius would have been done with a ball end mill, or what we call a ball end mill, uh, where you have a, the bottom of the tool is actually shaped like, uh, like a ball half a ball, um, but the really interesting part of that is, is this relief, the way it comes down. The un and you're right, and the, the undercutting, undercutting and this right. groove right here, so, okay. And as you can see, you, you have the larger radius here, but anything that would fit up against it could have a smaller radius. Uh -huh. Okay, so that, that, that is a unique feature. Now the other thing is, the size of the radius. Okay. So that, that is going to require another tool. So if you were just bashing this out with a, a dolerite ball, you wouldn't have this undercutting like that? Uh, well, actually, they, they wouldn't have bashed this out and, and achieved this. They could never but, have bashed this out and achieved no, this? No, no. No. That's the, uh, I'm going to melt this. Melt this. Try that again. Going. There, there, nice. I'm going to melt this forming wax and press it into the corner.
and I don't actually, yeah, that looks good. I've actually done that previously, so uh, that already had the shape of the radius. So now you've, okay, now you've got a form, a wax form of the radius, and you can use that to check the consistency of the radius. Correct. And so if you check this radius, even in, even in this corner, okay, uh -huh. where you have one, two, three surfaces actually meeting, and if I slide it along that radius, we get the pretty much the same radius, except for the, this flat part because the evidently it uh, it, the, it came out, or there's a I think it must be a larger radius there. But if you, when you get down into here, let me look at that. Yeah. So you have a consistent radius, and you know the question is, for something like this, why to get something even remotely close to a, a perfect radius, you'd it would take a uh, a tremendous amount of time by hand, but then to replicate that along the length of the block. Right, to keep it so uniform is just yeah. so much effort to do that. Right. But if you're using some kind of machining tool, it would happen naturally. You couldn't do it any other way. That is, that is correct, yeah. Uh-huh. That is correct. We have the uh, other half, or not a half, but uh, the uh, portion of the block that has been broken off. Um, evidently, the, they took the end off, and it doesn't have the same features, but the uh, basic geometry is the same. And the radius, as you slide it down, radius is fairly close. There, there's, obviously, there's going to be some imperfections, but That's a uh, precision radius gauge, 1530 seconds radius. See, that's, that's incredible. I mean, that, that speaks volumes, you know, to find something like that on yeah. something so ancient. Uh -huh. That I would have to use a modern instrument or a, a modern gauge. Gauge, yeah, and it to, to check its precision. Well, and it, would a millimeter gauge also? I mean, it would doesn't matter whether it's inches or millimeters. I mean, no, no, a radius is a radius. A radius is a, a radius, radius, right? Yeah. But and so, no, it, it wouldn't matter. But you have the whole thing of the you know pyramid inch <clears> and, and them using those those measurements, but it, that's not what you're looking at. No, it? no, no. It doesn't matter whether it's in inches, millimeters, uh, cubits, uh, yeah, whatever yeah, pyramid right, inches. Yeah, okay. A length is a length. A radius is a radius. Uh, right. Yeah. I mean, it's the consistency and accuracy. Uh -huh. of, it. of course, you know this this is not quantitative in it by any means because the. Uh, for that, you really need to have some measuring instruments to check coordinates on it. You know, um, today we would use a CMM machine, a computer, I mean, a coordinate measuring machine, uh -huh. <coughs> and uh, and check it that way. But mm -hmm. no, of course, the, you know, the other the other part of it is that if you had a precise template. Um, and you fit it to the template, then you, know, you, you could have that, you could create that contour. The, the evidence of machine work is, is in this block, it's in other blocks. Uh -huh. the, the, the mountain of evidence that we find is in the Serapeum. Okay. In those uh, giant granite boxes. And it's kind of these inside corners that are so difficult to make without machine tools, right? I mean, is that kind of what? That, yeah, I mean, this is this is not done with a dollarite founder, mm -hmm. or a chisel, for that matter. You want? No, 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 no okay. not a chisel. <laughs> not a chisel. So you have to ask yourself, why would they even want some? 
curved piece of, of granite like this and then go through the effort to, to actually create it. Well, that's a question that I've asked myself. It's, and it is a, the obvious question is, why would they do that? Because it, it doesn't resemble anything that, uh, you know, that would fit with a statue or, you know, it's obviously for construction. Yeah, I mean, but, uh, but, uh -huh. but in construction, we don't work with this kind of precision. Okay, yeah. All right. And there's another piece of evidence that we'll look at down near the Valley Temple, on the south side of the Valley Temple. Of the seven wonders of the ancient world, there's only one left, and that's the great pyramids of Giza. What secrets do they hold? And what we see here is basalt paving blocks on the southern side of the pyramid. But here we find something curious. We see actually saw marks here in the basalt. And in fact, this big saw mark here is going far behind inside this block. I mean, it would appear to be modern sawing. However, apparently this was done not in modern times, but in ancient times. Yet, looking at this cut, it must have been made by something like a machine tool and a diamond saw. This is not something that could have been made with crude tools like uh, copper chisels. Here we also see saw cuts. And we can see a, a saw cut right here along the edge of this basalt block. This too appears to be done with some kind of a modern tool, yet this cut was apparently done in ancient times. Were modern construction techniques used in the building of the pyramids, or were they built with stone balls and copper chisels? Well, we know that there has uh, been cataclysms in, in history, prehistory. Um, I don't think that nobody can argue that. The only thing that argues against it is some of the, the uh, conventional evidence, uh, archaeological evidence, for the time period of the, of the pyramids. But if you look into that time period that's ascribed for the building of the pyramids, you don't find the tools. They're nowhere to be found. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe you have to go back earlier there has to be an earlier civilization that suffered a huge cataclysm, was totally wiped off the, off the face of the planet. Okay. Interesting here, this hall is kind of like the doors of Machu Picchu were standing. Mm -hmm. So here at the Pyramid of Abu Rawash, not many tourists come to this one. It's on top of a mountain and appears to have been uh, buried in some kind of a uh, landslide or something.
Yeah, this is like a, a rock cut ramp right through a solid mountain. And then they've lined it with large limestone blocks. It's like the entrance here to a pyramid. Wow. One of the alternative theories on building the pyramids, one that's been proposed by a, a French chemist named Joseph Davidovitz, is that the pyramids are actually poured into place. And the blocks are a, a form of molecular concrete we know that the Egyptians used a form of concrete, the Romans used a form of concrete, the Mayans used a form of concrete. And here at Abu Ruwash, just outside of Giza, we're also seeing the extensive use of concrete. There is extensive granite down here inside the pit of the pyramid of Abu Rawash. And granite is not found here at Giza. So any granite is coming from the Aswan quarries, which are 500 miles to the south. Chris is saying that there must have been a, a roof over this giant pit at one time. You, you can see part of it. But there would have been apparently massive stones Lentils spanning this roof must have been huge. Here's a very interesting granite slab here at Abu Rawash. It shows all the indications of having been cut with a modern saw. Uh, it's been smoothed and you can see, in fact, the, the saw marks on the block. Well, you know what, David? There are certain features to this that really don't lend to the theory that it was sawn. Really? Yeah. Uh, you see this cut right here where the cut yeah. ends? Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Well, it's on a radius. All right. And it goes this way. So it's very it's, large radius, okay. but it, it, it is like a, uh, it's arcing that way like a that. Bit. All right. Yeah. Now, if you're going to be using a saw, you won't get that. You won't. It'll it would be, be impossible. It would be impossible. Okay. If you're else? sawing from here to here, regardless of what you use, it would be impossible. Unless you know, I mean, you, whatever cut that had a radius to it. Now the question is, you know, is it a true radius? What size is it? Obviously, it's quite huge because, you know. You, probably goes out to that radius. So what kind of a tool would you say is, would be used to cut that then? Well, I mean, if I've seen similar features in, the, in a machine shop, OK? OK. All right, and that's another feature on this. Um, if you have a, like a milling cutter, a very large milling cutter, and it's tilted on an angle, then you're going to cut a, a large radius uh, on the surface, OK? Um, actually, you're cutting more of an ellipse. But you know, if you're covering, you're covering the area enough, then it's going to appear like a radius. In fact, there are, are calculations used uh, in, in tool and die making that uh, give you the angle of the tilt of your tool uh, associated with the diameter of the tool that will give you a specific radius. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is, a, this is <laughs> remarkable because it has all those features. Now, <clears throat> okay, forgetting that, if we come back to uh, this particular object, what, what tool actually 
created this. Um, that to me is, um, I, I don't know of any primitive method that will create that. The, uh, we have a, a feature right here where evidently there was, uh, it came into a particular area and then it, it uh, went off track, so they lifted it up and proceeded on. Um, because you've got a, a ridge there. Yeah. All right? Yeah, yeah. You can see it. Yeah, I can feel it. All right. Yeah. So but they were starting to you, cut it. Right, okay. But the interesting thing is, when you look at the striations on the block, because you can see them yeah. right here, uh -huh. it does appear that it was a tool that was radiused. Now, of course, one could argue that um, they used a saw that was somehow curved. And, you know, it had one fellow on one side, another fellow on the other, and they were just like, doing this business. But the problem with that is, how did it create this curve here? Uh-huh. And so if we take this straight edge, you'll see that there's light in the center. Uh -huh, right. Okay. So it's slightly dished out. It's slightly then. dished out. And as you track across the surface, that light does not go away, nor does it change much. Fascinating. So, I mean, in the, in the mainstream Egyptology, explanations of bashing this out with a stone, uh, using copper chisels, it, that would be impossible in your mind to, to create this. Well, you wouldn't create something like that, bashing it out. Now, um, there have been some experimental, that's, there has been experimental work done where they have cut granite using a copper saw in hand and, um, but, to the extent that they would actually create something like this is quite remarkable. Not only that, look at this, you know, the size of it, that's quite a large saw. This is a very interesting block. I mean, and so in your mind, this is evidence of modern type of machining, advanced machining, but done in ancient times. I would say, that if we were looking for evidence of ancient uh, methods, I wouldn't expect to see this. If I was in a machine, modern machine shop, this would not surprise me. You know, with this uh, fascinating block of granite that appears to be sliced by a giant diamond saw, this is the kind of thing that I'm hoping we're going to find uh, on the Altiplano of the Andes in Peru and Bolivia at Puma Punku and, and other sites there. This is the ancient sun temple of Abu Gharab on the edge of the western desert of Saqqara. This ruined pyramid area once contained an obelisk at the top, and all around it are scattered blocks of granite and alabaster. Here at Abu Gharab, there is evidence of ancient machining. Chris, what do you think about this block here of granite? Uh, well, as you can see, David, there is a, a hole. It's uh, actually been core drilled, and uh, it has similar features to the, the uh, hole and core that uh, Petrie described in his book, Pyramids and Temples of Giza, and which I wrote in my book. Okay. And the, uh, the striations are visible there. 
It's very difficult, I mean, it would be difficult to find out if they are, it's actually a spiral, but if it's anything like the core that is found in the Petri Museum, then those striations do form a spiral down the entire length of it. And that would be only done with some uh, modern machining type tool? <clears throat> That's what I concluded, that it was some kind of sonic uh, core drill. A sonic core drill yeah. doing that. Right. Would there, and what is the mainstream explanation for you know, a, a hole like that? Um, well, the mainstream ex explanation for doing this kind of work is to use copper and sand and essentially rotate the copper in two directions, okay, with a bow, a bow drill. And it's a cop, is it a hollow copper tube then? A hollow, a hollow copper tube uh, attached to a piece of wood where you rotate the wood and the, and the copper by wrapping string around it and uh, attaching the ends to a piece of wood. Like a bow and a drill. Right, and then you, you just rotate it that way. The, pro you, uh, the, pro the problem with that, that uh, method, though, is that the core in the Petri Museum shows that the, the spiral is only in one direction. Uh-huh, okay. And also, the feed, feed lines, or the feed rate, that's the distance that uh, each striation has, the distance the drill goes in a 360-degree rotation, okay. is almost one-eighth of an inch which is an incredible feed rate. And we see striations here, and it, like I said, it, it's very difficult to really tell whether they are a continuous spiral down, down the length of it. it um, but still, it's quite, quite interesting. Yeah. This is what they call the alabaster altar here at Abu Ghraib. It's a curious uh, star shape made with about four giant slabs of alabaster. And it also shows some evidence of ancient machining. Yep. Well, uh, what we have here is a perfect circle uh, cut into the stone. And essentially, it looks like what they did is they came down with a core drill in this corner right here, uh, because you have that machine as a depression. That would, have that would have left a central core. But then, what they would have done is machine this surface and, and to, to meet this, this is a feature right here. So they started out with a hole and then machined that. You see the difference in tool marks or the, the difference in geometry here. You have the, the uh, geometry of this tool, which has a larger radius here. And then you have the geometry of the drill. Uh, and so they drill that out, knock the core out and brought this in. And then cut this and onto a radius and there are one two three four five six seven eight of these features around the block now what they would what they were intended for I, it's a mystery yeah yeah what are the purpose of all this and, and even why they would cut this out like this is um... and there's a uh, another uh, of these features over on that other corner uh, except that it's not a full circle, it's just like a half a circle. And so if you were actually doing this with a very slow, laborious hand drilling uh, thing, you probably wouldn't have, you know, overcut it like this, right? Um, well, I mean, I, I'm not saying that that's necessarily the case, but the, the, the problem that we have with, with uh, the conventional theory of cutting stones, such as with you know, stone and bashing with stone, chisels or just grinding it with, with or lapping it. Uh -huh. um, is why, you know, the, these surfaces are very smooth, okay? Uh -huh. But you'll notice 
Now, some of them sur the surfaces are smooth, but you'll notice that the alabaster is very brittle. Uh huh. And it has and the anyway, crystals yeah. in it. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is not a this is not a stone that uh, you would actually bash with, with another stone. With another to, stone. To okay. achieve this kind of uh, smoothness, flat, smoothness right, right, flat right. surface. But, um, they created this feature as a relief so that a, a mating part or, or a mating object, something that would fit snugly over the top of it. Okay. Because what, if you follow this surface here, it goes right into this area here where the, this radius starts. Okay. So that, that's, that's the only explanation that I have for that. That, that you know, this is, this is meaningless except for clearance. Clearance, okay, yeah. and then other stone blocks then were fitted all, down all, in here. All whatever it was. Whatever it was. Stone. Yeah. Yeah, okay, out of stone or even possibly metal what, parts. Whatever material that was available uh, in prehistory. Uh -huh. So, you know, this is another example, and there are many of them throughout Egypt. Another example of very, very uh, high proficiency in cutting stone, and in my opinion, they had to have had uh, advanced technology. And here is the, the other feature right here, where you have that, that circle, which is actually a half. Uh-huh. Okay. And the same, the same kind of features, the same radius here coming into the corner, but this is a sharper radius right here. So you have a sharp radius there. And... <coughs> To the life of me, I can't understand why they found these necessary, but they, obviously they had a need. I mean, today in manufacturing, we have lots of weird shapes. Uh-huh. But, yeah. well, and here's another one, see? Yeah. But they didn't, uh, this is further away from, from the uh, corner. From the corner, yeah, right. All right. So uh, it's quite fascinating. So it's right. clear that they started each of these uh, niches by first coring down here and then cutting away yes, the rest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So evidently, what I would suggest is that whatever, so that something fit on top of this thing. And it, this, these surfaces are on an angle. And so whatever fits slipped on here and they cut this out as a relief. And so whatever fit on it came in to this surface right here. And so what you have is a relief right there. That's great. And, and now, wow, look at this, you guys. Here's a, a saw mark on this circular piece. Look at that. It's been cut in. Now, how did they do that? I think we need to get up on top so that we can uh, examine it more closely. Basically, you're going to start here. You're going to reach the, uh, the the top or the the top of the radius the maximum distance and then and then uh, taper out so i'm going to insert this room key uh-huh and we'll check it out and it gets deeper there and then it gets shallower and comes back out again yeah right that's fascinating and anything well with this feature and all the other features that around us. I am totally convinced that this platform was designed to hold something else and then lock it in, into position. Because of because tightening, you know, just uh, just uh, this feature alone indicates that uh, they were that they were placing something on there. And uh, because otherwise why 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 have it? I mean, this is a pretty sophisticated and, and like modern engineering way to, to fit giant blocks or even some kind of machinery or something, right? Well, I, it's not sophisticated or, or even modern. Uh, modern by our terms in, you know, the last, ever since manufacturing first started, it's, been, it's a common feature. Mm -hmm. they, use it to, they use it to attach uh, objects to shafts. They will, they will cut something like that and then drive a screw in and, and hold it together. And uh, I mean, it would, and of course there would be like say four of these around yes. this circular thing. Yeah, yeah. to attach things. Uh -huh. But then with the other features, um, 
that indicate that something actually was dropped on here, um, it, it's all, it all begins to make more sense now. Mm -hmm. And do you think that this was also probably cut with uh, like a circular saw, some like, you know, a machine tool? Well, yeah, I mean, this, it, I would say with the weight of evidence throughout Egypt, obviously they were using machine tools, but uh, you know, this could have been cut with anything, you know. It's, it's a very, very simple feature, and there's not much material to, to, to remove there. To okay, sure. <clears throat> And look at this one here, David. This. How, did, how did it get here? It's, it's suspended like a, a dolman, but it's actually uh, on that corner right there. Yeah, it's touching on like three points here, right? I mean, yeah. that's a huge block of limestone, man. That's huge. Are weird. Wow. So here we have a very curious series of megalithic alabaster bowls. They have a, they're scooped out. There's a, there's a hole on one side to, to let uh, some liquid out. Each one has these curious cogged features on it. The cogged features also have small uniform drill marks going on them, it, it, it almost seems like they're a, a form for, for something else to fit over. What do you think, Chris? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, l looking at these, I would, uh, I would say, and we will, we will take a, a different view of them, but the, uh, what I would suggest is that these were the basis for uh, a column uh, that fit down in here. Um, and then perhaps the column itself had a, a hole. Was it a hollow, a hollow going all, all the way, way down? through it. Uh-huh. Uh, and then uh, probably it collected water uh, from a gutter above. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then the water drained into these bowls and out of that hole. Okay. Okay. Now, there are some of these on the other side of the pyramid that are in situ. So we could take a look at those. Okay, and you, you think these have actually then been been moved here by? Yeah, yeah, these have been moved here. Yeah, and you will you, you will see that clearly when you look at the ones that are in situ. Okay. Yeah, looking at at this uh, west side of the pyramid here at Abu Ghraib. It, which once had a, an obelisk on the top, it appears that this whole pyramid was, was just destroyed in, in some giant cataclysm, some big earthquake that just, just destroyed it and scattered these blocks around. Is that what you think? This is, yeah, essentially the, uh, what, what uh, I described earlier in, the, in that there was this huge cataclysm. All these devices, which were finely tuned to the uh, resonance of the planet, uh, and the planet was overloaded with energy, and they just vibrated apart. And you can see some of the blocks are uh, cracked. If we walk around this side right here, there's one actually in the, uh, towards the center of the pyramid, a huge block of limestone uh, that it's appears to have been, you know, just thrown up thrown and then up, dropped down. Down and, and, and split apart and cracked and yeah. stuff, yeah. I mean, in the idea that it would have been, uh, somebody came here and decided to tear it down, that would have been extremely difficult, right? I mean, to just, you know, bring these blocks yeah, down. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, they could possibly could have tumbled these down, but why pick a block, tumble it down, and then not use it and leave it here? Yeah, right. I mean, if they but, wanted to, to quarry and, and wanted building material, why not take these stones with them? I why, mean, not, why not use the, the one that you've already tumbled? Yeah. And what we have here are hundreds of blocks that have just been thrown off the pyramid. Thrown away. So it's like yeah. a more like a natural disaster yeah. rather than a man-made destruction. Yes.
So this is all just cut into solid rock here, these chambers. Man. So, what is, th these are the... Coffins here. The big coffin and the cover, and he covered it with a wood to make protection for it. Protection for it. But here it is. Here are the because giant sarcophagi without the cover, and that's the lid. So it's weighing 85 tons, and how much is this lid weighing? I think, I think all cover and the coffin weigh 85 tons. You have to go down if you really much. It's a really strange place, huh? It's, I mean, we're deep underground here, and yeah, yeah. on either side are these, these bays, and in these bays are these giant, huge basalt sarcophagi. They're incredible with these, these huge lids, and then, man, these things, they weigh 85 tons, the, the lids weighing like 50 tons. It's extremely hard, basalt. Uh, I mean, how they could move these inside here, it uh, defies explanation, really. Um, and it's a, such a cramped, tight area that you, you can't get a lot of workers in here to, to do things. It's amazing. Man, wow. Look how this is, is cut here, too. You can see how it's suddenly sloping down like that? Man! Wow. How, how did they make it so smooth and polished? I think they are very technical worker in this time to make it very, very, very soft to touch. Wow. Boy, these edges are really square, too. It's This one? Yeah, here you can see the lid pushed back. Sarcophagus is open. It's been chipped away right here, probably trying to open it. According to the traditional Egyptologists, these giant boxes were sarcophagi for the mummified bulls of Apis, sacred bulls of ancient Egypt. Yet the big mystery really is, so, uh, is how they could possibly get boxes such gigantic 85 ton basalt sarcophagal like this in here. And in theory, just to put a mummified bowl inside. Here, it's, it's very smooth here, uh, very, Uniform radius. It's it's these inside corners of box like this uh, that are so difficult to make without modern machinery, modern machining tools. According to Chris, it's is basically impossible uh, to bash something like this out, and and you you just you have to have modern machining tools, uh, modern sonic drills and saws uh, to, to really make something like that. And it, e even today, this, this would be almost impossible to make, even with mo modern machinery. Wow, this is just so amazing. So smooth along the sides of this Basalt, it's so smoothed out, and then it's been etched here. Yeah, here you see the the edges here of the of the box, the sarcophagi. It's all chipped here, probably from crowbars going in to try and lift this 25-ton lid off the top. So it's been. It's all bashed in and chipped on this corner. But otherwise, it's just so smooth, such a perfect corner here. 
Wow, it's, it's just really amazing. Wow. Well, I'll just see if I can lift this 25 ton lid up a little bit. There we go. Oh, I can just hold it up for a few seconds. Ah, there. Oh, that's about it. Whew. This is the 85 ton granite box that's unfinished. It's still rough. You can see right here in the corner, but the lid is now on the other side. So apparently this was being moved into the Serapium, but in the end was, was just left here. Uh, some Egyptologists think this was probably being taken out, although others say it was being brought in. You can see how you can, it barely fits in these tunnels, this giant 85 ton block. I mean, how even workers could be moving around this while they, while they, while they theoretically moved it in here. It's, it's, it's really, a, a, it's, it's, it's an enigma. I mean, how could they do this? This is amazing. It was an incredible day. We still had time to visit the mysterious red pyramid. A pyramid with some sort of chemical residue inside. All right, now we can move into the main chamber now. Watch your head. Wow, look at this horrible ceiling here. Oh man, this is cool. Oh wow, that's high. Similar to the Grand Gallery. Yeah, yeah, it is really similar, isn't it? Wow, it's hot down here too, man. Oh. So do you think we're actually, you don't think we're underground here, are we? We're more like a level of the uh, Giza Plateau? Actually, yeah, we're, we're not underground, but uh, we're right at the Right at the ground level. Ground level. Okay. Yeah. And we couldn't see that when Look how perfectly these blocks fit together. That is incredible masonry. Man, there's a huge block right here. Lintel over the door. This is the main inner chamber here, huh? And that's, so it's three giant corbelled chambers deep inside the pyramid here. Yeah. There's a very strong ammonia smell in here, which would be from perhaps chemicals that were used in here at some time, or, or would it just be from bat guano or it's something? Like, it smells just like ammonia. It doesn't smell like urine, uh -huh. uh, which would have a different smell. Oh, like, like pure ammonia, yeah, well, like phosphate or ammonia. I mean, it's a really strong smell, very strong chemical smell in here. Uh, it's overpowering. You, you almost can't stand it. I mean, I, you couldn't stay down here very long. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's a, yeah, this, there's certainly a very strong, resonant, uh, echoing it within these chambers. It's, it's, it seems as if it's built for resonance and sound. 
she's two chambers away. Or yeah, that's right. Yeah, chamber, yeah. And down the passage. That's right, and then she's down that other passage. Yeah, that's wow. And she's just stamping her foot on a on a wooden platform. Yeah, that's something. Hmm. Sounds like Godzilla is coming. Here inside the pyramid too, we can really see how perfect the construction is. How these massive blocks of limestone are, are perfectly fitted together. I mean, couldn't slip a piece of paper or a knife in here. You see how the joints all come together extremely finely. I mean, this is, this is really precision construction. This is the finest kind of, of megalithic stone masonry that, that we can find anywhere. Oh, back on the surface. Daylight again. Oh, oh. that's quite a trip. <laughs> you don't have to be crazy to drive in Cairo, but it helps. <laughs> within the Great Pyramid. And what we have is a series of passageways and chambers and shafts. It was a study of the 
dimensions and the geometry of these shafts and chambers and the um, residual material that it were left inside. Also, the selection of materials in particular areas. In the Great Pyramid, we have a descending passage that goes down to a bedrock chamber, uh, about 350 feet from the opening. Of course, we could talk about the precision of the Great Pyramid, and the precision is considerable. It is uh, that passageway itself was surveyed by William Flinders Petrie in the 1880s. And he determined through his measures that the passageway was straight in the constructed portion to within 20 thousandths of an inch. That's the thickness of a thumbnail. Over the entire length of the chamber, the full 350 feet, it only varied a quarter of an inch. That is an amazing precision. The subchamber itself, I am now coming to realize, uh, was actually using hydraulics to cause a, cause a pulse generator. It actually generated a pulse that drove the entire pyramid into harmony. Of course, moving up into the, the pyramid, we have the ascending passage and many unusual features that are found there, such as the granite stone plugs at the end of the, end of the passageway. They don't seem to have any real construction purpose. Uh, while the theory is that they were there to prevent tomb robbers from entering the center of the pyramid, really all they did was attract attention. And Al Mamun, when he chiseled into the, the Great Pyramid in 812 AD, did so when he identified those granite plugs and determined that perhaps something may lie behind them. And sure enough, what lay behind them was a shaft. He chiseled the limestone around them and a shaft straight up into the heart of the Great Pyramid. Coming to the end of that small shaft is what they call a Grand Gallery. The Grand Gallery is considered to be an architectural masterpiece. It is, consists of corbelled layers, seven corbelled layers, where the the gallery actually gets smaller towards the top. Also, in the, along the side of the Grand Gallery, we have ramps, and into the ramps are cut these, these notches. Uh, these notches are cut vertically into the ramps. There are 27 uh, pairs of these notches, and as you go along the length of the gallery, you come to what is been called a, the Great Step. Climbing up the step, you have a horizontal passage, and then through the horizontal passage, a small antechamber, uh, then again, another small passage into the King's Chamber. The, the King's Chamber complex is the heart of the power plant. It is constructed solely of granite. It is tuned to a high degree to resonate at 440. It also emits naturally an F-sharp chord, and this was detected by the, an acoustic engineer named Tom Danley in 1995. The chamber is freestanding within the heart of the pyramid. It is not connected to the core blocks and is free to resonate and vibrate at will. Overlying the king's chamber, we have five layers of granite beams. These granite beams, I speculated in my book, are actually resonating beams. They are unusually cut. They're cut square and flat on three sides, but the top side is very rough. The roughness on the top side, I believe, was done in order to tune the beams. Uh, uh, just, like a, just like you would tune a bell, you would actually remove material until you achieve the tone that you wanted. The whole complex is like a musical instrument, and each feature lends resonance to the other feature. In the King's Chamber, we have a box. I call a box. Uh, conventionally, it's called a sarcophagus. However, uh, there have been no mummies, uh, original burials, found in any pyramid. And there was nothing found in the Great Pyramid, 
even when al-Mamun entered in 812 AD. So the question is, what were these for? Also in the chamber are two shafts that lead to the outside of the pyramid on angles. These shafts, uh, in the northern shaft, they have a 4.8 by 8.4 dimension. That is suitable for a waveguide in the microwave region, a hydrogen waveguide. <clears throat> in the southern shaft, the opening is shaped like a horn antenna. This is quite significant. If you consider that a signal coming into that chamber, if that chamber contained energized hydrogen, that signal could stimulate the emission of energy, collect that energy, and feed it into the southern shaft. Other features. Well, we asked the question. If they were using hydrogen, where did they get the hydrogen from? Well, for that, we go along a very long horizontal passage to what is termed the Queen's Chamber. In the Queen's Chamber, you have several unusual features. You have two shafts, similar, but not, not quite the same. Uh, in the Queen's Chamber, you have a shaft uh, leading from the chamber to the south, and one leading from the chamber to the north. When early explorers went into the Great Pyramid, they did not detect these shafts. They did not, they wouldn't have known that they were there. The only, the only reason they were found was because a, a man in 1872 by the name of Wayman Dixon was in the chamber and detected a crack in the wall. He pushed a rod through that crack and he found no, he got no resistance on the rod. So he chiseled away the, the limestone and lo and behold, behind, the, behind that plate was the shafts. He did the similar thing on the northern face of the chamber and tapped around he, and found that there was another shaft there, chiseled out the limestone, there it was. These were intentional designs. They did not cut these shafts and then just put a plug in them at the Queen's Chamber. They were a part of the original block. So the question is, why? Why did they do that? In 1993, a German robotics engineer by, by the name of Rudolf Gansenbring sent a robot up the southern shaft. <clears throat> when he got to the end of the shaft, uh, it terminated at what is called a so-called door. But the question is, was it really a door? And the answer, I, my answer is no, it was not a door. It was just a plate of limestone. Um, through this limestone came, were two copper fittings. So these, are, these were really mysterious. And why would they put copper fittings at the end of this shaft? The solution in the Giza power plant is that they were actually electrodes and determined when the shaft was full of the chemical they were using and mixing to create hydrogen. Now you might ask why was the shaft closed at the end. So we have a shaft that's closed in two places. Terminated five inches away from the chamber at the bottom and with a plate of limestone at the top. Certainly you were, it wasn't for the passage of air for people to breathe. And even though you may ask that, you know, why would a, a mummy or a pharaoh uh, need to breathe if he was dead? So that was another mysterious question that we had to answer. So the Giza power plant theory actually proposes that both of these shafts contain different chemicals, a hydrated zinc solution and a diluted hydrochloric acid solution. These two chemicals, if mixed, would actually boil off hydrogen. The evidence to support that proposition uh, was found actually on the walls of the shaft and inside the southern shaft. On the walls of the shaft, early explorers found that they were covered with salt uh, up to an inch thick. 
they have subsequently cleaned up the salt, but uh, the salt was there. And that would be the result of hydrogen gas uh, boiling up and giving up some of the impurities in the, in the gas to the limestone. So the evidence for hydrogen is there. The uh, evidence that a liquid in the, was contained in those shafts is, is very strong. If you consider that a five inch plate of limestone, a liquid would percolate through it, whereas it would not pass air. In the east wall is a niche. The niche is corbelled. I proposed that it had an evaporator tower there so that the chemicals that came into the chamber were actually wicked up into this evaporator tower and, and gave off the, the hydrogen. So let's climb along the horizontal passage again and we'll go down into, we'll go to the bottom of the Grand Gallery. The Grand Gallery is 82 inches wide at the bottom and 42 inches wide at the top and 28 feet high. It's quite an impressive masterpiece. I propose that within the slots, the 27 pair of slots going along the length of the Grand Gallery, were resonators, a series of resonators that actually coupled with the pyramid, drew the vibration and converted it to airborne sound at different frequencies. In other words, you, at the bottom you would have a larger resonator and stepping up to higher frequencies as you got to the top. In 1999, I noticed evidence that these resonators actually were there. And that evidence is on the walls and the ceiling of the Grand Gallery. Because in the past, in the history, there was a, a disaster, a huge disaster. And what happened was a, I propose that it was either a comet strike or some external force struck the planet. This caused all this destruction that we find around us and what we have talked about as we have gone around the Giza Plateau. The crack blocks and things thrown and jumbled all over the place. Now the signs of a, a, a cataclysm many thousands of years ago. Inside the Great Pyramid, the evidence of that cataclysm is around the King's Chamber and the Grand Gallery. With the use of hydrogen, and also if you have the introduction of oxygen after the casing stones are stripped off, you could probably, you will probably have the conditions, the right conditions for that hydrogen to explode. The evidence is inside the chamber. The walls were actually pushed out over an inch. The ceiling beams were pushed up and they were cracked. So what we had was an explosion, the walls were pushed out, the ceiling beams lifted slightly, they fell down and cracked along the south side. Also in that chamber, the sarcophagus or the granite box is a different color than the rest of the granite. It is a chocolate brown color. And I propose that that too was a result of this exp explosion, that the granite box, originally a pink Aswan granite, was subject to tremendous forces and heat. And as a result, it's literally cooked like in a, an oven, uh, changing the color of the granite. If we go back out through the antechamber and onto the Great Step, and if we look at the ceiling of the Grand Gallery, we will see the evidence of that explosion. The walls of the Grand Gallery have the evidence of a tremendous force, tremendous heat. And I'm not the first one to notice this. There have been architects and engineers who have been there and say that you know, the walls are vitrified. The evidence is there to support the, the Giza power plant theory. And also the design of the resonators, because on the ceiling you have these scorch marks, very, very deep scorch marks. The scorch marks weren't very visible until 
uh, the pyramid was closed for a year and they actually cleaned it. And those scorch marks then became very, very clear. And what we have are two scorch marks, two pair, or a pair of scorch marks on both sides on the ceiling. Also along the wall there are there are scorch marks that form a line, or the destruction seems to, the blast pattern seems to form, form a line down, uh, centered with the slots. So all this evidence comes together. But to sum it up, let me explain everything and how it worked. We start out with energy. That energy is the energy of the Earth. Seismic energy, vibration, feeding through the Great Pyramid. We collect that energy in the Grand Gallery and convert it to airborne sound. That sound and the natural design or the design of the Grand Gallery is such that the, any sound generated in, in the Grand Gallery will focus through that small horizontal passage into the King's Chamber. There, the sound actually builds and accumulates it affects the hydrogen in the area, and then you have a microwave signal coming in from the universe. Uh, the signature of the Big Bang is actually a hydrogen uh, signature at 21 centimeters. So there we have it. The evidence of a sophisticated, intelligent, brilliant society that created energy not in a way that is harmful to the earth or the people that live on it, but energy that resonated, that was in harmony with the earth. Generating the energy, they did it with harmony with the earth and drove the earth into harmony. We've just scratched the surface though. I believe there is much more that needs to be found and discovered in Egypt about this lost civilization. We'll keep looking. Chris's theory that the pyramids were some sort of power plants tied into the resonance of the earth fascinated me. I then wanted Chris to show me evidence that there had been some sort of explosion that was associated with the pyramids. So if the if these pyramids were coupled to oscillators and in this cataclysm, uh, some disaster, the pyramids just vibrated until they shook off all this granite, then for the later people who came here, the stones were lying just like this, just as we see them now, and then People were trying to quarry and split these stones, but they were already lying here, scattered and, and tumbled, Exa like we see them right now, right? Exactly. Part of Chris's theory was that the pyramids on the Giza Plateau were driving the Earth into harmony. So, I mean, in your whole theory, why these small pyramids? They're also just many big ones, I mean, to yeah, do the same yeah, thing? Yeah basically resonated at a higher frequency, uh -huh. but uh, still doing the same thing. Uh -huh. And the, the theory is that uh, what they were doing is they were causing, for want of a better term, mini earthquakes. And it is... They were creating mini earthquakes? Okay. Mini earthquakes. To sort of relieve the stress on the to Earth. To relieve the stress of the Earth. Uh -huh. And so, uh, even today, we're now talking about, say, the, the Cascadia Fault in America, uh -huh. uh, that where they're speculating now that if they set off many earthquakes, then you relieve the stress in the plates as, they, as one plate presses against the other. Right now, the friction takes over and, and they build up stress, build up stress, build up stress, and suddenly you've got a 9.0 Earthquake. Okay. Okay. And if you can relieve that, but with smaller and if earthquakes. You can, if you can relieve that, then, you know, you, you're going click, click, click. Many earthquakes. Uh, <clears throat> vibration, uh, which actually allows the plates to slide smoothly over each other, rather than building up stress. 
but in, in your whole theory of like the Great Pyramid having uh, a maze or energy in it, but are these also have some chemical that's put in them, or they're just a they're just a pure geometric form on the on the plateau? Yeah, I, well, the Great Pyramid is different, and and really just the generation of energy is not the prime purpose for the pyramids. The prime purpose for the pyramids, in my opinion, it was to actually create harmony, uh, to drive the planet into harmony and to relieve the stresses of the Earth's, Earth's plates. Now, if you're able to do that, if we could do that, you know, we can generate power for decades, right? Just from the Earth's, the stress no. of the Earth's crust. Yeah. The point I'm trying to make, David, is in our society, electricity is king, power, energy, we use it for many, many purposes. Uh, and we can sustain a civilization for so long. Uh, all that, that whole civilization can be wiped out by an earthquake, by a, you know, a huge uplift in the Earth's crust. Mm -hmm. Can just totally destroy everything, billions and billions of dollars. Okay, yeah, right, yes. just the tectonic yes. plate shift that we can't, we can't control it now, but we, if we could control it, yes. we could harness power, and these yes. pyramids could do that. Bingo, you got it, that's it. That's what they were for. Fascinating, fascinating. And so you go from, you, don't, you not only have uh, the smaller pyramids, or the larger pyramids, but you have the different frequencies to match with different frequencies in the Earth. Because the Earth is a, a jumble of frequencies. They, they detected the, the hum of the Earth in 1998. And the, the hum is very, very, you know, really sub, sub frequencies uh, with, uh, with a whole jumble of, of different, different frequencies. So, you know, the Great Pyramid resonates still in the King's Chamber. To 440, uh, it resonates to an F sharp chord, uh -huh. as, as Tom Danley detected in 1995. Okay. And my theory is that that energy is still being channeled through the pyramid. Through the pyramid, right. And of course, the King's Chamber is a structure that's freestanding within the center of the pyramid. It's not dampened by the walls, it's not connected to the core masonry. The floor is not is not dampened because it's it's suspended on nodes. The uh, upper relieving chambers, there are five layers of them. Why? Why? You right. Know, and right. The, the whole purpose is harmonics and resonance. That's it. Okay, harmon. Right. Now, with the smaller pyramids, you do have you do have difference in design, and so I, while it's very important to relieve the... Let me start again for a minute. Okay. Anytime. Do you remember what you're saying? Okay. So what we have is a progression, and what is, these were important for the relieving of the Earth's stress. Uh -huh. And so was the Great Pyramid. However, obviously, they reached a point where they said, well, we've got all this energy coming through these things. Why don't we harness it? Uh -huh. So they built the Great Pyramid, and they harnessed some of that.